This has been a great morning. I, uh, I think I heard some little one in the back said, I'm winning. <laughs> it was Steven. It was Steven. He, he, he won the race. Every day is a race. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 today. The, uh, the, the choice of Steve this morning to uh, pray one of the Puritans' prayers was um, very impactful to me. I've been in the Puritans recently, and we're going to talk about the, the affections of the heart, and that's a Puritan idea. And so uh, bear with me, because this has been a great morning. Great morning. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts might be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, you have gathered us together to to be to the praise of your glory. And so today... May we continue to glorify you in, in our hearts, in our minds, in our understanding, in our faith, in our hope, in our peace, and in our love with one another. Lord, may your word uh, break through hard hearts. May it, dis- may, may it encourage discouraged hearts. May your compassion motivate us to love one another. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I have a question for you, and I don't, I don't mean for this question to, to put any kind of doubt on your sincerity or maybe discourage you, but I have a question for you. Why are you here today? Again, not trying to draw into question your sincerity, but sometimes we get stuck in a pattern or in a habit, and sometimes we don't know why. We don't know why we do the things that we do sometimes. Now, I, I, will, I need to put something out here. The fact that God has given our mind and our being the, the ability to follow habits and form habits is a huge blessing. I don't know if, if you've ever thought about what it would be like to have to make decisions at every step of your life. Those, that decision-making process would be remarkably draining, okay? I don't have to decide what bed I'm going to sleep in at night. Granted, in our house, we have a lot of beds. I have a lot of choices. It's basically habit that I sleep in that bed at night. Though my wife would like me to know why I'm sleeping in that bed, right? We we find that maybe if, if I'm gone... Camping or out, staying up until 2 o'clock in the morning on a New Year's Eve. Um, she has a hard time going to sleep. Same thing with me. If she's, if she's out doing something late, I have a hard time going to sleep. We, we have a habit of sleeping in the same bed together. But guess what? I need to know why. Have you thought about why? Sometimes we forget to think about why. And so today, I want you to think about why you're here today. Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about the existential question of why you're on the earth or why you exist. All right, if we're going to answer that question, God created you. And he created you to display his glory. And he created you to witness his glory. All right, so that's why you were created. But why are you here this morning in this church with these people? That's the question we want to get at today. As a local church body grows in its affections for Christ, and their understanding of Christ, they become a heavenly outpost, a stronghold of love and truth here on the earth. Now, at the end of chapter 1 of Colossians, we saw that Paul's ministry to the Colossians was was made up of essentially two things. it, it It was him proclaiming the word of God, 
and the people maturing. That's, that's how the individual Christian matures. They hear the word of God and they mature. The, the chapter 2 here sounds like the same message. Paul's message or Paul's ministry is to proclaim the word of God and the church would grow. But catch that difference. The end of chapter 1 is talking about individual believers. The beginning of chapter 2 is talking about local churches. It's in God's design that the individual believer grows when they hear the word of God. Let's say matures. The individual Christian matures when they hear the word of God. But also the local congregation matures when they hear the word of God. That's, that's in fact the purpose. So Paul's ministry to the individual actually has a purpose also. And that's to make the local church body mature. That's its purpose. Which means that he's not going to deal with the church as a bunch of individuals. He's going to deal with them as a group, a single group, a family, a piece of fabric is one of his illustrations. An army is another one of his illustrations. And so with that in mind, here's the question for you today in the issue of the local church. What is expected in the life of the local church? Okay? Number one, their affections for Christ will be stirred. And number two, their agreement in the truth of Christ will be solid. Their affections for Christ will be stirred and their agreement in the truth of Christ will be solid. And the, again, the reason is when this happens, the local church becomes this stronghold of love and truth. Now, chapter, chapter 2 starts with the, word, with the word for. Now, maybe not in everyone's translations, but it's there close. Chapter 2, verse 1. For, I want, you to know, I want you to understand how great a struggle I have for you. This idea of for is tying what I've already described, the end of chapter 1 and the growing of the individual to the beginning of chapter 2 with the mature church. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. The you in this is the church at Colossae. And for those at Laodicea, right? The church in Laodicea, about 10 miles away. And for all those who have not seen me face to face, that, that draws in all churches under his perspective. It's des and this letter is designed to be passed on. At the end of the letter, he'll say that. Hey, you Colossians, pass this letter to Laodicea. They'll pass their letter to you. And also make sure this goes to a place called Hierapolis. Hierapolis is about 10 miles north of Laodicea. They form a little triangle in the Lycus Valley. And Paul's point is... I'm dealing with you as individual churches. But what I have to say to you is the same thing I have to say to them and the same thing I have to say to them. His desire is to see all of these churches grow. This actually highlights the reality that a local organized church is a real thing. Now, for us in our context, many of you drove by a church to get here this morning. You had an option to go somewhere else, but you chose to come here. Why did you cho choose to come here? Now, the reason I bring that up is, if you lived in Colossae, you wouldn't walk 10 miles to Laodicea, and you certainly wouldn't walk 13 miles to Hierapolis. You'd walk one mile to the gathering of the people around Colossae. This idea of choosing which church you would go to didn't exist. They were united as a church and they will be dealt with as a church. And so when you read Paul's letters, he will identify a church. You people are dealing with this issue and this is how you deal with it. They would hear that, they would read that, they would read it over and over probably. They would test what he had to say against the Old Testament and they would, and they would come to this agreement, yeah, Paul's right. We do need to... You know, change in whatever way Paul's talking about. Paul deals mainly in churches. Even his letter to Timothy, an individual, was with the intent of helping the churches that Timothy was ministering to. Paul deals in churches. And as he's engaged in this, number one, he wants these churches to have their affections stirred for Christ. 
Number one thing he's going to do is look at how their communal love is, is building. Now, this word affections, probably you hear affections and you think emotions. Your, your emotions should be stirred. The, we, we get this word affections from the Puritans. And the Puritans stood very much against emotion-only religion. They, would, they, would, they had these derogatory terms for people who just got all excited and stuff for no reason. So they, they hated emotion-only religion. But they also hated intellectualism religion. And so they would talk about true religion, true Christianity, the true faith as a fire. And every fire has both light and heat. The light being the truth and heat being the, the emotions, the stirring up of the inner man to, to be for whatever truth it is that we believe. So the affections, it's, it's not just emotion, though emotion's involved. It comes from what you believe and it plays out in a zeal and a passion for something. This, this idea of emotions is what Paul here is talking about. See in... Again, verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Verse 2, That their hearts may be encouraged, knit together in love. This, this idea of the gathering of believers is not just a gathering for fun. It's not just a gathering of stuff. You see, this common affection draws them together. Now, we actually see this play out in other ways. We see people gathering under common affections, right? The Seahawks fans wear blue and green. The veterans display the red, white, and blue. Ford drivers keep driving that blue oval. Okay? God be with them. <laughs> they unite under these banners, and Christians also have a common affection, but it's a better one. Not just better than the Blue Oval, better than any of them. Their connection's not in fight songs or colors or cars. It's in the person and the work of the Son of God. It's, the, it's an eternal glory, whereas all these other banners that people might gather under are all temporary. They're all fading. They spring up and they disappear as quickly as the grass in summertime. But the Son of God, this, kind of, this connection is a supernatural connection. He is eternal, therefore the connection that we find within the church is an eternal connection. It's always and forever. Verse 2 calls this being knit together. The word actually does mean knit together, but if you were to translate it, it sounds a lot more like you stand together together. And it's this idea that you take multiple threads and you weave them in such a way as the individual threads kind of disappear. They, they disappear into the fabric. It becomes hard to identify where one thread starts and another one stops. But, but also, the fabric is more useful and strong than the individual fibers. Being knit together is becoming part of the fabric of the church. As this happens, you might, under, or you might have the question, though, what's knitting them together? Is it the truth or the love? Now, you might want to say both. Paul doesn't say both. But we like to say both because in America, we like to think that just about anything can bring us together. Well, churches today gather around a number of different things. They might say it's the truth. They might also say it's love. Uh, they might say it's um, their location. They, they might say it's the music. They might say it's the coffee, the color of the walls, right? Weird is right. There are strange reasons why churches gather together, but the reality is the church of Jesus Christ is brought together by the truth and held together by love. Like an electrician can bring four or five pieces of wire together and twist them together with his pliers, he's brought them together, but then he takes the wire nut and twists it on, they are now held together. Two different things, two different processes, both useful in the electrician's plan, also useful in God's plan. Paul's desire at these local churches would be, would be made up of people who are brought together by the truth that they believe. 
But once pulled together, they are held together in love. They are knit together in love for one another. Know this. Being pulled together by what you call love will eventually fall apart because if it's only love, it's not actually love. The church of Jesus Christ is built on the truth of the word of God, which is the expression of God's love toward us. We are brought together by the truth and held together by love. This stirs the affections that we have for one another. But there's another thing that does that, and that's assurance. So verse 2. Again, Paul's desire is that these churches would have hearts encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach the fullness or the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. These Colossians have been brought together by truth. They've been pulled together by that common gospel, and that's good. And Paul's even talked about that. He's identified other things, that that them being pulled together has has resulted in them bearing fruit, and the local congregations around them have seen that. They've talked about the love and the the walk of faith of this Colossian church, and that's, that's awesome. And yet, there's a question. Are they actually trusting these things they believe? Or did their interaction with the Word of God stop at just knowledge? Throughout the scriptures, people have heard the Word of God, and they will know the Word of God, but they're often put to a test of whether they or not they trust the Word of God. And an example I want, I want to think about here is in Genesis 12 through 21. It's the story of a man named Abraham and his wife Sarai. And actually at that time, his name was Abram. God made a promise to Abram. I'm going to make you into a great nation. There's going to be a lot of people in your family. What was the problem with that promise? Abraham had no children, and he was 75 years old. His wife, 65 years old. Everybody here recognizes the problem they've got already. And yet, chapters later, decades later, still no children. Sarai expresses her deep discouragement over not seeing God's promises fulfilled by actually taking her servant and giving this young servant to her husband so that they can procreate and form a child there. Sarai was in a place of utter despair. That question of, has your knowledge of God's word resulted in a truth of God's word? In fact, when God comes even a decade after that episode and tells Sarai, by this time next year, you're going to have a child. Sarah's response was indignation. She laughs at the idea for she was already 90 years old. 25 years after the promise, they finally see it play out. And yet, what do we learn from that? We learn this. God's word is entirely trustworthy. God's word is entirely trustworthy. Whatever he has said will happen. If he has promised to protect, he will. If he has promised to provide, he will. Now, if he hasn't promised to protect or provide in a certain situation, expecting him to trust and provide, or to be trustworthy and provide in that situation would be foolish. We don't trust in something if God hasn't promised it. But if he has promised it, it is trustworthy. The Colossians had been saved by God's word and were being protected by God's word, were being fruitful through God's word, and yet there was that question. Are you trusting it? Because these false teachers were coming in proclaiming a different gospel, and the Colossians were starting to listen to that different gospel. They should trust in the truth that they already know. Paul's ministry was to make it not only that they knew the word of God, but they had assurance that the word of God was true and trustworthy and worth depending on. His his work is to bring about an assurance, a trustworthiness. And And as the local congregation would all agree on, 
the, the truth that they're trusting in, now nobody's fighting to find truth. They're actually just set free to love one another. You want to know what a house looks like that's divided and what they agree on? Just look at the U.S. Senate. Look at the U.S. House of Representatives. What we, what we come to realize is if you have a group of people who aren't in agreement with one another about what is true, that house is divided and make no mistake, it will fall. We don't know when, but it will. But the church, on the other hand, finds great peace and assurance in the fact that what they believe and trust in is true and trustworthy. That was Paul's mission, his, his design, his ministry in the church was to get the Colossians to trust what they already believe, which is Christ. Verse 2 again, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. The... Uh, the society that we live in tries to view everything from a godless perspective. We have to recognize that godless push, and we have to be able to test everything against what the Word of God says. All good things come from God, and the best thing that He gave is Jesus. And so no matter what else we find, whether it comes through religious studies or pseudoscientific promises or psychology or education or politics, you test everything against the truth of Jesus Christ, for in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The church has to learn to trust the truth above everything else. And the church in America today is failing. We dim the lights down, we turn the music up, and we, we start the smoke machines and the light show and the bubble machines, and the feathers are falling from the rafters. And we're trying to claim that Jesus is with us. And God is with us, and the Spirit is with us, and God's moving. And all those churches are doing is manipulating emotions. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.2 calls it walking in craftiness or adulterating the Word of God. The foolishness that happens in those churches reminds me of a quote that Charles Spurgeon said well over a hundred years ago. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep... The church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Boy, did he nail that one. The past decade has seen pastors entering the pulpits in Cadillacs, zip lines, and base jumping from the rafters of their mega churches. Those are all serious examples of what has happened. Those churches have people coming out of them wondering what's true. They've been so distracted by the fun and the excitement, they've walked away from Jesus. They've become like the church in Laodicea that, oddly enough, was mentioned in this letter. We see them again in Revelation 3. They had become lukewarm. They were useful for nothing. They found themselves in a situation where they were so busy being something other than church, Jesus is now knocking on their door asking to just be let in. May we never become like that. For true fire has both light and heat. And here at Peaceful Valley Church, we must remember that the light of the fire of the gospel must always remain central. And if it does, the heat will come from that. We must remain committed to teaching the word in all of our contexts, whether it's Bible studies or Awana or preaching or VBS, junior church, Whatever it is, we must remain there in the word in such a way that our affections are stirred for Christ and his body. And when that happens, again, we become that heavenly outpost, that place on earth that is a stronghold for love and truth. And so it bring, that brings me back to my, my question on, on this sermon. What's expected in a local congregation? Again, the first thing is that our affections for Christ would be stirred, but the second thing is that our agreement in the truth would be solid. That means that we deflect attacks and we are disciplined. As we've seen so far, everything that matures us comes from the Word of God, and therefore that's what ministry is, is to declare the Word of God. When, when the Word of God breaks in and changes people, they are built up, 
And, and so everything that I've covered in the beginning of the sermon becomes the foundation for the second part of the sermon. The foundation, the root, the, the solid rock on which the solid church stands. Some of these solid things are, are the fact that God is creator and that he's created man in his image and in his likeness to declare the glory of God. But man sinned. And so God cursed man but promised a savior. God's word is the place where we find that he has sufficiently and completely told us where the savior would come from and how it would work. And that savior is Jesus Christ. But this promised savior came through a line of people who were rebellious. Just as rebellious and sinful as every other nation on the face of the earth. And yet God remained faithful. And it, through his sovereign grace, gave us the promised Savior. And if you would believe in the person and the work of that Savior, you would be saved for all eternity. Those are some of the foundational truths that we must stand on as a church. But what happens, though? You get a smooth-talking, pretty face coming in, selling you a bill of goods that sounds great, but it's actually a lie. Those deceivers come along and they do what verse 4 says. I say this in order that no one may delude you. Delude you. Having your vision clouded. Having your vision clouded. What happens when your vision is clouded? You begin to wander in the, in the directions that you walk. When a group of believers gets their vision clouded, when they become deluded by these plausible arguments, these human ideas, they run the risk of ceasing to be a church. What I mean by a church is a gathering of believers in Jesus Christ. They might still meet together, but they're not a church anymore. By the time of, of the, the, this writing, again, we see this in Laodicea. And so watch the argument that we have in verse 4. This comes from false arguments. Plausible arguments. History has shown that if there's an outright attack against the church, the church usually grows. But if there's a plausible argument that's introduced in the church, the church deviates and gets destroyed. A twisting of the truth is a far more de um, destructive thing than an outright con contradiction of the truth. After all, when Satan spoke to Adam and Eve, he didn't tell them, there's no such thing as God. He actually acknowledged there is a God. He put in question God's word. Did God really say? And then he offered a truth statement that was close but not quite. And Eve fell into the trap and she was close but not quite. And after a couple of closes but not quite, what do we find? Rebellion and open sin. The destruction of people from a plausible argument. These, these things become problems for us, and so Paul's desire is that they would remain solid. He uses two military words here, order and firmness. Some of them will translate it discipline and stability. Whether Paul is with these churches or if he's not in these churches, he wants to know that they are ordered and firm. This is verse 5. For, I know, or for though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. These two words are military terms. Order means to stand shoulder to shoulder. It, it's what they're talking about when, a, when an army is in formation and standing in attention. But... When, when the Romans would speak of an army in this way, they weren't just interested in roll call. They weren't just interested in what they looked like to their general or their king. They, to say that they are orderly not only means that they can stand in a straight line, but more importantly, that they, that they can function in the way that they were designed to function. To say that, the, that an army is orderly means that the tank driver can drive the tank. That the radio operator knows how to operate the radio. That the physicians know how to do good things to people who are hurt while on the field. To say that they are orderly means that everybody can play their role successfully. That's what Paul's desire here is. They are a well-oiled machine. They, 
do what they're supposed to do on their individual levels. And so as a whole, they're functioning correctly. In order for this to happen here at PVC, you're going to need to know three things. You're going to need to know, first of all, who's in charge. And the answer is quite simple. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We all answer to his command. The elders are not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. So the first question, who's in charge? Jesus is. Who am I? That's the second thing. I need to know what my role and responsibility is. That Jesus has specifically given me within this local congregation. And I need to work to fulfill that role and responsibility. So who's in charge? Jesus. Who am I? Well, your, your answer to that question will be specifically for you. You need to know who you are. Here's the third question, though. Who are the people around me? I need to know what your roles and responsibilities are so that I can engage you in such a way as you can fulfill your roles and responsibilities that Jesus has specifically given you. This is what it means to be an ordered church. Secondly, he talks about firmness or stability. It's the idea that if your army is in some sort of formation, they can withstand an attack at every front. Whether it's head on or from the flank or from behind or even from within, they're stable. Doesn't matter where the attack comes from, they can withstand the attack. This requires that every single person know what is going on. Now, no general is going to train every single soldier in every single job. I mean, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're not saying that every single person in the church should get their, their PhD in theology, right? But we should all know what the story of the scriptures are. We should all know what our, what our King Jesus thinks. We should all know what, what the attacks are going to look like so that we can not only be the first line of defense, no matter who we are, we can all be the first line of defense when a spiritual attack comes, but we also know how to raise the alarm. We also know how to raise the alarm. We see the attack coming and we know what to do about it. Every single person within the church doing their job. That's what it means to be stable or firm. So are you wondering what your role is? What your responsibility is? We still have that question. Why are you here today? What's going on? Are you stable are you part of this organization? Well, let's, let's start with a simple step. If you want to know how this works within the local church, I have some study for you. Read and study Ephesians 4. And you're going to find in Ephesians 4, rather than using the illustration of a body, Paul's going to use the illustration, uh, rather than using the illustration of an army, Paul uses the illustration of a body. Within the body, every part has a role to play. And it brings this question, what part of the body are you? How do you engage? Here's another thing you can do. You can actually think about where you're already engaging in ministry. Because most likely you already are. My advice for you is to continue renewing your mind with the word of God. So that you're more prepared and fit for service in God's kingdom. So with these churches that Paul's dealing with, they didn't really have a choice to run away. If, if they heard Paul say something to them, they have to deal with that. In our context, if somebody tells you something you don't like, it's easy to run away. It's easy to not listen and, and run away unchanged. You become like the, the people of the Old Testament who went into the temple and went out unchanged. The, the work of the church changes us. As we're ministered to, we can minister to others and we all grow. The, uh, the reality is God has put you here. God has put you here. And he's gifted you specifically to engage here in a way that's beneficial. Where he gets glory and the people around you receive the love of God and the truth of God's word. Every single person here is useful. Using the, the picture of the body, there's no such thing as vestigial organs in the church of Jesus Christ. There's no one useless. No, no one is the um, tailbone. 
Which, by the way, if you've ever broken your tailbone, you know it's not useless. Okay? There's no such thing as useless people in God's kingdom. He brings you in and he gifts you to do something for him. So again, are you thinking about where you fit? Probably the question has come into your mind, well, what program should I sign up for? You might have noticed we don't have a lot of programs. We do have some. We have, you know, you could be a teacher, Sunday school, VBS, Bible studies. Um, you could engage in a, a few other programs. But for the most part, we don't have many programs. But what we need to realize is, is that the church is not a building or an organization so much as it is an organism made up of people. Ministry in the church is engaging with its people, not necessarily its programs. And most likely, because you're gifted by God, you're already doing something that you don't even consider to be ministry. God gifts people with the gift of mercy, for, for, for instance. And these people will find themselves listening to other people a lot. Why? Because there's something about them that's begging you to tell, tell them your life story. This person with the gift of mercy, I just need to tell them stuff. Okay? Now, some people with that gift of mercy don't like it, but it's a gift from God. And to simply be a compassionate ear to those around you that are hurting or concerned is a beautiful ministry. Some people have possessions, and their gift is to be, is to be gracious and giving. Other people are hospitable. Other people are teachers. Other people are servers. There are a number of, pl of places and roles for people to play within the body of Christ. If you're looking for a program, you can come talk to me. But my advice to you is to look for the people that you know you should be ministering to. Now here at PBC, I want you to know our elders are concerned about this. Not, not concerned in the way that we think you guys are all failing, but concerned that we want to make sure we are empowering you to engage with the people around you. One of the ways that we do that is through official church membership organized. We want us to know and we want you to know who it is you're ministering to. We want you to know who's ministering to you. We want everybody to realize who your family is. Official gatherings in this way happen all over the place. In fact, in our family, we had a couple of, a few kids actually, get adopted into our home. We treated them like kids. From the moment they came into our home. And yet there was a couple of years when they weren't officially part of the family. They functioned as part of the family, but they weren't officially there. Until the day came when we went to the courtroom. And we made vows and we signed paperwork and we made promises. And we said, yes, these are our children. So much so that they went to the birth record and they put Tasha's name on the birth record. Okay, that's, that's what it takes to take that step of official church membership. Does it mean that you're actually now a part of it? No, you probably already have been. But taking that official step is, is, is us agreeing with one another. We are together. Together. A part of the same body. Gifted to serve and to be served. So, again, if you're still wondering, please come and talk to me. Where do you fit in? Why are you here today? Come talk to Pastor Josh. Come talk to any of the elders. And I'm going I'm to tell you, dealing with church membership, we as elders, we're going through a church membership class planning session. It's going to take us a little bit of time, so be patient with us. But we want to be able to tell you and explain to you what it means to be a member of this church. And as you go... Recognize what Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, speaking of the body, that as every person plays their part, the body builds itself up in love. That's Paul's goal, and that's our goal. So we as a church of Jesus Christ, when we have our affections stirred for Christ, and our commitment to the truth of Christ is, is assured, and we can stand firm on that, 
We become that stronghold of love and truth in a community that needs it so desperately. So please, be with us. Be with us as a part of that fabric, as a part of that army, as a part of that body. Let's pray. Lord, you have gathered us, and so we stand um, in awe of you. We stand in attention waiting for your command. Uh, we, we stand here desiring to know your heart so that we can walk according to your heart and not our own, as though we were a bunch of individuals. So, Lord, b- bind us together. And for those who, who struggle with the idea of being part of one local congregation, Lord, make them feel at home. Make them feel a part Help them to engage. And may we be zealous for you. May our affections be stirred. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.